Gospel reading from Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If any one wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? for a broken ankle, Bill having eye surgery. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Happy birthday, Chris.
healing, that's good, but that's a stubborn infection. Uh, not an easy one to beat. But he's not the kind of fellow that can sit for long when there's stuff to be done, I know. Father, we come to you this morning as always grateful that you invite us to come to you, that you want to hear from us, and that you call us your children. Lord, we lift up this morning all of those who have needs. We pray for David, that you would touch him. Lord, that this healing would go smoothly, that there would be no complications from it, that his ankle would heal normally. And Lord, we pray for Bill as he goes for the surgery, that you would guide his surgeons and that everything would go well, that there would be no complications, that the surgery would be successful and the recovery would be complete. Lord, we thank you for Chris and we thank you for the milestone that he celebrated and we thank you, Lord, for the blessing that he is to so many. We pray that you would continue to keep your hand on him for good. And Lord, we pray for Tom that you would continue to work the healing in his body that he needs. We pray, Lord, that you would cause this infection to be eradicated from his body. Lord, it can be resistant to whatever it wants to be resistant to, but it can't be resistant to you, and we pray that you would do this. Lord, we thank you again that the girls had a great time at camp. We pray that you would help all of our kids to continue to learn and to grow. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us as the Sunday school year starts, that we would be able to give them what they need. Lord, we pray for Vivian, that you would touch her, that you would continue healing in her. Lord, that you would help them to understand what's going on and that you would bring it to correct it. Lord, we thank you that Bruce is feeling better, is doing better. We pray that you would continue the healing in him. And Lord, we do pray for that complete and full recovery. And Lord, we pray for all of those who serve, whether it's here at home or in the military or on the mission field. We pray that you would be with them, that you would watch over and keep them safe. And that you would help them, Lord, to do well what they do. Bless them. Lord, for those who are stranded abroad in difficult and dangerous places, that you would be with them and that you would bring them home safely. And Lord, we thank you that this anniversary of 9-11 passed without any further tragedy or issue. But Lord, we pray for all of those who were affected by the things that happened on that day in 2001 and also in 2012. And for those who lost loved ones, for those who found themselves shaken to the core, 
We pray, Lord, that they would find their peace in you because you are the peace that cannot be shaken. Lord, you are our peace. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. You are our peace. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be with your people. Continue to guide us. Continue to walk with us and to help us to walk with you. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our second hymn is number 458, the Gentle Shepherd.
take what we have to give, that you would multiply it and use it to meet needs, that your word would go forward, that your work would be done, and that your love would be shared with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we come now to the children's message. squeeze to get everybody in one pew, huh? <laughs> Have any of you guys ever been by a military base? Well, it's got a big fence around it and usually a gate and there's usually guards at the gate that are there to keep track of who's going in and who's going out and make sure that nobody's going in who isn't supposed to. There's a few places around here that are set up like that. Uh, if you go over to Knowles Atomic Power Lab, you'll see some really good security on that place. And there's a National Guard base in Latham that's pretty secure too. Well, there was a verse in the Bible that said, Lord, set a watch over my lips. And what they're saying is, God, I want you to guard my mouth, to make sure that nothing comes out of it that isn't supposed to. Did you ever say something and think, oh, I wish I hadn't said that? Yeah, me too. That happens to just about all of us at one time or another. In fact, it happens to some of us more often than maybe we'd like to. But what we've got to do is remember to ask God to set a guard on our mouth to make sure that we don't say things that are not going to make Him happy. Because if we're saying something that hurts somebody else, that's not going to make Him happy. But if we're saying things that help other people, that build people up, that's good. That's the kind of thing that he wants us to say. Now sometimes we may have to tell people something that they don't want to hear, but it's still the right thing to do. If somebody is doing something that they really shouldn't do, and it's our place to do it, we may have to tell them, you need to stop that. You can't do that, that's not right. We need to do it in a way that doesn't say, you don't, what are you doing that for? We need to do it in a way that's not mean. We need to do it in a way that tries to help them to see where they're wrong. Do you think you can do that? I think you can. I think the first step is to ask God to help you. Ask Him to set a guard on your mouth so that you say the things he wants you to say, and you don't say the things he doesn't want you to say. And I'm going to do the same thing. Okay? All right. All together, bow your heads, let's pray. Lord, right now, we are praying that you would set a guard on our mouths, that we would say the things that you want us to say, and that we would not say the things that you don't want us to say so that we can help other people and lift them up and not put them down or hurt them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? All right, guys. Thank you. All right. Off we go to the book of James. refrigerator, there is a small jar with what looks like coffee in it. Don't be fooled. It is concentrate. So that you can add a little bit of that to a glass of ice water and make iced coffee. If you were to take any of that straight, you would then have to run laps around the room trying to catch your heart, which was beating out of your chest and trying to escape. 
It's uh, really potent stuff. The book of James is kind of like that. He's uh, not really a long book here. It's only like four or five pages. But boy, does he put a lot in it. And it's some strong stuff that he has. Let's pray. Lord, we ask now as we look to your word that we pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. James chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with great strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot directs. And so also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison, and with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and curses. My brother, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. May the Lord add this blessing to his word. Wow. If you follow any professional sport at all, you're probably familiar with the term performance enhancing substances. There are all kinds of things out there, anabolic steroids and human growth hormone and as soon as they find a test for one, they'll come up with something else to replace it that they don't have a test for yet. All of these things that uh, certain professional athletes will use, not all, but certain ones, to try to enable them to run faster, to jump higher, to hit harder, to last longer, to have more stamina, to have a faster recovery time, whatever it is that they need to do be able to be at the top of their game, whatever it is. And yet, for all of that, nobody has yet come up with something that you can ingest or inject that will enable you to master the most powerful muscle in your body. And that is your tongue. Now, wait a minute. When's the last time you saw somebody doing bench presses with their tongue? How can that be the most powerful muscle you have? Believe me, you can do a lot more damage with your tongue than you might realize. How many, uh, how many of those athletes have ended their career because they said something stupid? It's happened. And it doesn't just happen to athletes. It happens to movie stars and singers and grief politicians. It happens to everybody. Sometimes the stupid things that can come out of our mouths can be career-ending. Sometimes they can be friendship-ending. Sometimes they can be marriage-ending. And sometimes they can be life-ending. Don't ever underestimate the power of the words that we use. You know, we had a big old German Shepherd when I was a kid. His name was Max. 
good dog, but he did not like to have anything encroach on his territory. He was extremely territorial. Our vet called him the rubber hound because over the course of his life, he got hit by three cars, a snowmobile, and a tractor because he would chase anything that went by. Unfortunately, that was not limited to motorized vehicles. And so Max, on many occasions, came home smelling like skunk. And my maternal grandmother lived with us when I was a kid, and she had the only color TV in the house and the only air conditioner in the house. So if I'm being pragmatic, I admit that probably has something to do with the fact that my world centered around her. But whenever the family would be gathering and the dog would come in bringing that odor with him, Graham would say, phew, and immediately my mother or someone would jump up, grab the dog, take him out of the room, bring him someplace else. And Max was no dummy. He put two and two together, and it got to where all she had to do was say, phew, and he'd get up and walk out. <laughs> One day, it was hotter than blazes. And Grandma got up and walked out of her air-conditioned living room into the family room in the middle of the house that connected her part of the house to ours. And it was a lot warmer in there. As soon as she passed through that doorway, she said, whew, it's hot in here. And Max got up and plodded up the stairs, where it was even hotter, of course. And she felt terrible. And she stood at the bottom of the stairs and called and cajoled and tried to get him to come back downstairs because she felt bad. But he heard it. He heard what she said. He knew what it meant. So he just plopped down at the top of the stairs and laid there and looked disgusted with the world. Sometimes the things that we say have results that we never intended or anticipated. In that case, it was completely harmless in intent. She never meant for him to take it that way. She never meant for him to take it any way at all. She wasn't even registering the fact that he was in the room when she said it. It's not always that innocent. When I was in school, I was probably 14, 15, somewhere around there. I was sitting at a lunch table talking to someone else, and a littler kid, probably about three grades behind me, came over and sat down at the table. And I can look at it now, and I can see he was a good kid, and he was just looking to hang out. But he came over and sat down, and I made some kind of a snarky remark about being pestered by pests. And he got up and walked away, and the look on his face when he did was so crushed that I immediately felt that big, and I wished I could take it back. But taking it back wouldn't have been cool. And I was trying to be cool, so I let it stand. That's one of those moments that I still wish I could go back and fix. We all have some of those, don't we? The things that we say that we didn't intend for somebody to get hurt, we were just trying to you know, make ourselves look a little good. But somebody did get hurt. It happens. The title of this sermon is, In Order to Steer the Ship, You Have to Know Where the Rudder Is. James refers to the tongue as being like the rudder. Great big ship, but where it goes is determined by this small piece on the back end. That's what tells you which way you're going to go. I'll bet everybody here, except maybe the kids, know the story of the battleship Bismarck. I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version for 
those of you that don't know it it was during world war two and germany was at war with england and england is an island so they absolutely have to get supplies brought in by ship in order to survive and so germany turned loose this battleship that was fast and powerful and if they could get out into the atlantic ocean and start destroying all of the ships that were bringing supplies to england it could have put england in a really bad spot so the british fleet went out looking for it and the first time that they found it the battle didn't go well for the british one of the ships that found it was called the hood now the hood was the pride of the british fleet it was one of their best but it had one weakness it was a battle cruiser which means that it was armed like a battleship but it wasn't armored like one its armor was thinner so that it could be faster and when the two ships started shelling each other a shot from the bismarck hit just the right spot where it was able to break through and it blew the hood to smithereens and at that point the whole british navy went <gasps> because they thought if there was a ship on the sea that could take the Bismarck, it would be the hook. And the hood lasted 15 minutes. So, everything else that they had went looking for the Bismarck. And what finally got it was an old torpedo plane. An old plane that was like 20 years old at that point that was so old that the wings were covered with fabric. You know what that means? Cloth. And it came in and it dropped a torpedo and that torpedo hit the Bismarck in the only spot where it could really hurt it and that was the rudder. And the Bismarck couldn't steer anymore. All she could do was steam in circles. And so the rest of the entire British fleet was able to gather around and gang up on it and finish the fight because of that rudder getting damaged. Small part on a big, powerful ship, but with that small part taken out of play, it was all over. It doesn't matter how big or how powerful we are in other respects, if we can't control the words that we use, we can't control anything at all. It doesn't matter how good a sermon I can preach if I can't control what comes out of my mouth when I'm angry. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't matter how much you love your neighbor. It doesn't matter how good you are at anything if you can't control the words that come out of your mouth. Here, when you're angry, or just when you're not paying attention. The tongue is definitely a blade. And it can be a sword, or it can be a scalpel. It can cut through to where the problem is, to remove it, or it can hack the life out of somebody. It all depends on how we use it, how we direct it. Think of every word that we say as a seed. You ever walk through a garden and planted seeds? What gets really interesting is when you walk through a garden and you're planting seeds and you don't know what they are, so you're waiting to see what's going to grow. Most of you guys are probably too sophisticated to agriculturally to do that, but I've been known to do it. Well, what grows depends on what you planted. Remember my dad planting a bunch of squash once, took them across the street from the house and put them in this side hill it was all shale. It was just a disaster. It was the worst ground possible to plant anything on. And he told my mother, well, the package said to plant them in hills, so there you go. <laughs> Her reaction.
is pretty much the same as that one over there. So, we don't know what we're going to grow if we don't know what we're planting. Think of every word that you say as a seed that you're planting, and it's going to bear fruit. So what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be briars and thorns? Or do you want it to be something sweet and tasty? Give it a thought before you say whatever it is that you're going to say. Is this something that I am going to want to pick fruit from and eat? Or is this something that I am going to spend a long time trying to hack out of there and dig up the roots to get rid of it and tell myself, you dummy, why did you ever plant that? The army of God. If we were to go to Ephesians, we could go through the entire list of all the armor of God. The sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the belt of truth and the shoes of peace. We could go through the whole list. We could picture in our minds what we would look like wearing all of that, bearing all of that, and wielding all of that. The army of God. It's been known as the only army that will fill its own way. We don't want to be that army. We want to be the army that collects the wounded from both sides and does their best to heal them and get them back on their feet. We want to plant the right kind of seeds. So the words that we say have that kind of power, we need to choose them carefully. Like we did with the kids, we need to ask God to set a watch on our mouth, that the words that come out would be what he wants, and not what we might think is best at the moment. Mark Lowry used to say the only thing that his mother ever wanted was the last word, and he tried to give it to her. But something brilliant would always pop into his mind. Sometimes it's best if those brilliant comebacks that pop into our mind don't go any farther than that. Because what we think might be witty and hysterical might crush somebody else, might cause them to get up and turn around and walk away in more ways than one. And if you find yourself where I was, where you find yourself saying, I wish I hadn't said that, don't worry about looking cool. Say, hey, I shouldn't have said that. Own it and fix it. Because the quicker you dig that weed out that you just planted, the easier it is. Don't let it take root. We don't want to wind up like the Bismarck, just steaming in circles until we're blasted into irrelevance. Because we didn't control the one piece that mattered. But had the power to steer our entire force. Amen. Closing hymns, number 425.